You're listening to Level Up's Emerging Market Series with Melissa Zalou from IronSource and Tom Wyman, Senior Market Analyst at Newzoo. So welcome back, everyone. I'm Melissa Zalou, and you're listening to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing, and of course, playing mobile games. This is the fourth episode of our exciting series on emerging gaming markets, which I'm co-hosting with Tom Wyman, who's Senior Market Analyst at Newzoo. After a great discussion last episode about the Turkish gaming market, today we'll be focusing on Latin America. And to help give us uh, his insight on that market, our guest today is Etienne de Gabriel, head of UA at Gazeus Games, which is a top gaming company from Brazil. Etienne, and of course, Tom, as always, thanks so much for being on the show today. Happy to be here. Yeah, th- thank you guys for, for letting me be a part of Level Up. been listening to the podcast for quite some time, so it's I'm definitely super grateful to to be a part of this. That's what we like to hear. So, um, Etienne, you're you're today you're head of UA at Gazeus, but you've had actually a long career in gaming and uh, and ad tech. Uh, you worked at Opera and Ad Colony uh, before you were at Etamax, which is another large uh, gaming company from Latin America. And now, of course, Gazeus. Can you walk us through your your journey? Um, what's what is it like? Kind of what are the differences between kind of working on the gaming side versus the the technology vendor side? Well, yes. I mean, I've been in the the industry for quite some time. I was lucky enough. Is I I always tell the, the the same thing. It's I've been prepared since I'm a kid. I'm a huge gamer, so everything like prepared me for this. So yeah, I, I started with Oprah, and then Oprah was acquired by Ad Colony. That was the first like gaming digital experience. Before that, I had my own app. That's how I met at Colony, and that's why they hired me. And before that, I was a professional esports player. So that's it. it all, oh, wow. it all, yeah, it all works together. It's it's a little bit funny, but that's a super interesting question because being a vendor and being able to work with all the biggest Latam companies at the time that I was at Art Colony actually gave me a lot of insights, like being able to understand each game and how different they work, it's amazing. Like, it worked wonders for me when I moved to the other side. I I call it when I was in the dark side, like being a vendor, it's always, oh, I'm in the dark side. But it it actually provided me with a lot of useful information and a lot of practices that I saw a lot of the big players doing, and I was able to replicate that for myself working on those gaming companies. So while I was at Intermax, uh, they they hire me after they they had me as their representative at Ad Colony, and guess it was the same thing. It's I've been working with them at Ad Colony for almost like four years, and once I went to Intermax, they told me, hey, there there's an opportunity here, and you know, I took the adventure. So now I'm here at Gazeus Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Very nice. Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've obviously, you've been involved in this industry since you were a child. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the gaming market in Latin America? Um, was it mobile first or were traditional video games also big there? Um, how has gaming kind of evolved? Well, I, I mean, I grew up part of my childhood. I mean, I was living in Argentina, but definitely it's interesting by no means I would consider it like one of the, the gaming markets itself. Like it, it wasn't big. I, I believe it's growing a lot the last couple of years. If we compare it to like super big, like Korea, Japan, China, like Latam is nowhere near, especially like five years ago. But now it's growing so, so much. Outside of, I, I would say Brazil is by far the biggest like gaming country i mean yeah i know we have a lot of people i mean there's a huge like there's a huge and a vast universe here of people so i mean of course you're gonna get more gamers out there but in the history i mean latin was all about you know just traditional sports if you say football then everybody's gonna start talking it's like it's religion and football go together here in this region but I'm lucky to see gaming is growing. Of course, it was traditional video games. Like, you know, it started with more, again, games related to like sports, like FIFA and whatnot. But now with uh, mobile, it's everybody's becoming more open to like, hey, I tested this out on my phone. Do you think it's cool? And that opens a gate to both of the games because you, you have people that start playing on mobile and then they're like, okay, 
well, maybe I can do the same thing on my computer, especially with COVID-19. I have a lot of friends that I, they, they, they used to make fun of me. Oh, you're, you're playing games because that wasn't cool at the time. Like 10 years ago, that wasn't <laughs> cool. But now it's cool. So everybody's playing and I, I like to see that, that shift in the culture. But yeah, so definitely traditional video games first and mobile, it's helping the whole gaming scenario grow a lot, so, so much. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, we haven't ever really covered kind of where the mobile is. Uh, we've looked at where the hyper casual games are kind of a gateway drug, bad choice of words, but you know what I mean, for um, mobile games of other genres. But we've never really looked at crossover from mobile um, to PC uh, or console, which is super interesting. Um, Tom, I'm, I'm turning to you now. Um, Etienne mentioned kind of uh, LATEM in relation to kind of larger gaming markets. Uh, and it is definitely catching up, um, sort of now coming up just behind China, the US, uh, Japan and Korea. Where do you think this boom kind of from news news perspective, where do you think this boom came from? Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of things I want to address here. So also obviously, um, getting that out of the way, it's it's of course um, the increase in, in smartphone users, online population, um, cheaper data, cheaper um, smartphones as well. That all of that, which is kind of true for every emerging market that we covered in this show in the past episodes, is also true for Latin America. But there are a couple of um, uh, unique elements to the market that um, are interesting to highlight here because uh, one of the things that Etienne was also talking about in this this concept of traditional video games and uh, yes, I also we also see that I, it's very small if you compare it to some of these bigger markets, uh, the traditional PC and console uh, video gaming, but it, it was definitely there. And, and if we, again, put it in perspective to some of the other markets we covered in this show, um, there is more um, PC and console gaming in uh, Latin America than, say, for example, Southeast Asia or India. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to hear from the uh, local expert as well, but I think part of the reason um, why uh, video gaming, uh, traditional video gaming was bigger in, in this region than those others is because culturally it's, I don't want to say similar, but it's more closely related to the United States and Western Europe. They're definitely Western Europe because um, Spanish, Portuguese culture is, of course, uh, also influential on Latin America. Um, and, and the same with the United States and Mexico. There is obviously also a connection there. Um, and I think for that reason, that in you know traditional publishers, traditional um, video game publishers would look at least, say, 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, where they would look first to Latin America before they start looking at something like Southeast Asia or something like India. Etienne, does that sound, does that sound about right? Does that jive with your experience? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Latin American culture really identifies with the, with the Western like, culture too. It's, it's like, you can see that, and another interesting factor, it's if you're going to publish a game and you're analyzing the, the, the different cultures, you really want your game to look Western so people are familiarized with the game and so you know just when you're adding a character when you're adding like different like genres and stuff and layers to the game then you're definitely thinking about you know going a little bit western and then if you're moving to like japan then you want some like different style but yeah it's it, it's definitely i definitely agree with tom on this and it's it's an interesting factor and another thing to consider when when building a game and when doing a you know a marketing campaign for Latam. Mm -hmm. And besides Gazes, who are kind of the uh, and well and Etimax, who are the big gaming companies in Latam? And uh, and kind of do you have are there? Is it a very um, not just in terms of gamers but also game development? Is it a growing ecosystem? Yeah, I the, so th there are a lot of good and really good like you know small studios. The, the, the good thing and bad thing about this industry, I, I believe there are two sides of the coins, is it's a super aggressive and hostile industry. Like, it, it, it's, been, it's been hard, like, you know, I, I believe less than 1% of the, all the apps in the stores make less than $100 a month. And we have, like, there are so many apps that I, I don't even know how to see the number. So, yeah. But I mean, the studios are, are, of course, all the well known. I was, I had the pleasure of working with them during my time, like 
the, in the last few years. So, well, guess those games, of course, the best one. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Mm -hmm. But Intermax, another great company. If, I, if I'm going with volume and, like, product, then Wildlife is also a good one. You have the, the guys from Ironhide in Uruguay. They make some amazing, like, Hardcore games, they're super good. Well, you got Taps games here in Brazil. Of course, Brazil is the, the biggest country. Mexico has been growing up a lot. But the thing is, there are many studios, but none of them really get that those games that like jump them to the next level. Because, I mean, they, they have a good strategy, but they still haven't gotten that, you know, big hit game that actually makes your company known and, you know provides with all the fame that it's something the other side of the kind that I was talking about is nowadays the industry has so much investment that there are I, I haven't like the potential that I see in LATAM from people making games from people just you know smaller studios with four guys just working there it's it's amazing that's why when when another opportunity that I see is now that the industry like it's not what it was a year and a half uh, I go. There's so much investment that if you don't have marketing to support you, like and to support your games, then your game is not gonna get any traction whatsoever. And that's one one of the the the, the thing I don't really like and the change that I hate the most about the industry. I I, I love it because it's constantly changing. I always call it like the meta is evolving, kind of <laughs> like an esports it's sports player. So it's like I call it yeah, the meta is evolving. But it definitely it's a, it's a meta that I don't enjoy because there are so many good games created by people. It's just they don't have the budget to invest. And if you want to, you know, look for them in the stores, then they're again, they won't appear. It's it's kind of that way. It's a little bit sad. Is that, is that true of um, when that is that true of kind of glo global launches or is that uh, and is that also the case? Uh, locally within LATEM, is it also very competitive and hard to kind of break into the local charts? Yeah, I mean, breaking, of course, it's easier. And the and by easier, I mean, there's going to be less competition and the budget is going to be way smaller. Mm -hmm. But it, it's true uh, it globally. Because if you go here, if you see the top charts, there are still all the big and top developers are going to be here in the region. So mm -hmm. you, you won't get away, like, it, it, it just, you know, it's a competition at the end of the day. It's good, yeah. keeps you pumped, keeps you motivated. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, unfortunately, it happens. That's why when I, if I, if there are any, like, others, you see a lot of, like, bigger studios acquiring smaller studios. And I think that's going to be one of the, the key factors for Latin America. Because, again, there is so much potential here, like, so so much that I cannot express like all the opportunities that I've had. Even myself now, I'm I'm starting to actually look at the smaller studios and trying to understand, trying to see if there's a a match there. Just as a side note, Etienne, before I, I move on to the next question, but I'm personally very interested to know what game you went pro in. <laughs> the, you didn't ask that already. Well, I mean, this was as soon as I finished, I remember I finished school and I told my mom back in the day, it was 2008, like, mom, I'm going to go pro in games. And she was like, what? Esports was not well known at the time. Yeah. She was like, dude, what, where are you going? What's happening? It was World of Warcraft. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah and used... my role. Yeah. Sorry. I used to play that a lot um, back in the old uh, vanilla days. <laughs> yeah, I got it in Burning Crusade because uh, that's when they started doing the competition. Because for yeah. me, that's gaming. It's, I mean, gaming has been my first memory that I've ever had in my life was playing games. So I mean, and now it's it's all about competition. Like I'm a, I'm an esports player, and I I really like watching esports, which is I don't know if that's amazing, but I love it. Like I, I can, like I get goosebumps, and nobody understands why. Just imagine this in Latin America. There's a football match, and then there's me looking at the monitor, watching, you know, the streaming platforms and watching esports and getting goosebumps. So yeah, I'm kind of the the weird duck in the family. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand. 
Uh, yeah, sorry to derail the conversation a little bit. Um, you were talking earlier about some of the different things that the developers um, in, in the Latin American region built. Um, at Gazeus, you guys built mostly casual social games, card games is what I saw a lot. Um, what are some of the most popular genres among players in Latin America? Well, there's, there are, I mean, casual games are, are all over the place. Like if I consider in terms of volume, then yeah, definitely the, the, the games that have more people playing them, it's casual. If we go with Dao and Mao, casual and hyper casual. But then if we go per like time sessions, then it's going to be mid core. You see, we, like I've seen in the last couple months, I've seen a lot of games like mid core, like just, just blowing out of nowhere. You got the, the Saint Seiya one, ate two cough here in Latin America. It's it's so good to see. Like I, I get so happy because like there there's a huge difference. Like in Latin America, it's hard to have a game like base within a purchase. At base, then it's all good. Though the ECPMs are gonna be a little lower than in other regions. Again, we have like mostly tier three countries in terms of ECPMs. But I I saw that game and I saw that game like having a lot of purchases and I was so happy about it. So, yeah, it really depends what you want to analyze, but I would say hyper casual and mid core, it's two different genres, but they both are, are, are taking off the last couple of months. Okay, uh, that's pretty cool. And what about uh, because I was personally quite surprised to see how well uh, Garena Free Fire did uh, in Latin America specifically. Um, I wouldn't even classify that as mid-core, though maybe your uh, your views is not are different. But uh, there is apparently also a, ro a room for these kind of games. What's your view on on that part? No, yeah, definitely. It has been it it, it took off. Also, one, another game you also have like, yeah, there there. Are, I mean, the, it's it's shifting. the The opportunity is there, and the the market it, it's really green. But what what it's happening is if we're if we're consider that then we also gotta consider the crazy situation that the whole world is going through that it's COVID nineteen that also opened up the the gate for a lot of stuff like all the behavior users are having right now I'm pretty sure they're driving all the algorithms we have crazy because everything changed it's it's amazing like. If you're a product owner and you're analyzing your products, I would definitely suggest doing a like before and after because I'm 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 convinced the user behavior we're seeing right now it's not going to be the same after all we're past all this like craziness. So, I don't know where the industry is going to like go, how it's going to shift, but it's definitely like worth analyzing. Though I would analyze it as a special period and not compare it to you know, my, when we had normal lives. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm with you on that one. I mean, that's that's really what we do at Newsu. So uh, you can understand how fun my job has been in the past couple of months. <laughs> um, again, switching the topics a little bit. Um, you at Gazis, you also operate a, a browser-based website. Uh, jogatina.com, although it might be butchering the pronunciation, sorry. Um, how does it compare to the work you do for mobile games and how do you do see the audience for that? Is there a big overlap? Um, are you seeing players switch from browser to mobile? Um, what's your take on that? Well, Jogatina started that way. It's been, it's been, it's been in, the, in the industry for like 14 years now, which is amazing. But I mean, Jogatina Gazeus. But yeah, they started with a browser and we still have a lot of players there. It's just the, the demographics show it's it's a lot of oh, like, you know, it's more mature people to say per se. So we didn't want to take it off, even though it's not like a lot. Of, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of representation in terms of like revenue and stuff. But since we started that way, well, they started, I wasn't a part of Gazios at the time. They started that way. They really want to, they, they keep working on it and throwing updates but no we don't the demographic is completely different we do see that now with covid we have more people there and the base on the on the site grew a lot so that that was funny to see but i mean before the 
the dark times, yeah, it was just, it, it was a super small like sample that we had there. We just keep it because it, I don't know that that's one of the values that I really like about Gazeus. It's their 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 plan is not to to see their games as numbers, but more to help people. You know, when you're immersed in that game and you forget about everything and you just get a couple of minutes in and, and just smile like you were young without any like hesitations and like worriness. So that's one of the good things about Gazeus. Tom, turning to you now, because uh, Etienne talked about kind of uh, ad-based games versus IAP-based games. Um, from from a research perspective or, or from a data perspective, where do you think the big opportunity lies for game developers in, in that term? Is it advertising uh, or ad-based games or in-app purchase-based games? There's two sides to this. Um, right now, I definitely agree with Etienne's read that um, advertising is is easier in the sense that more people uh, the people the players are are used to that way of monetizing it's uh it takes a lot of effort to convince people that in-app purchasing is um, worth it um when i talk about the opportunity um i think uh, the bigger opportunity might be in in-app purchases but it also depends on the type of game that you are developing like a hyper casual game with in-app purchases is probably not going to work like might be proved wrong at some points, but um, if you are doing something in the mid-core core, core um, segment, then yes, in a purchases as as the bigger opportunity, and definitely because there is so much room for growth uh, in that specific place in the market still in Latin America. Mm-hmm. And and now let's uh, it's kind of been popping up uh, throughout our discussion. But now let's let's talk about the esports scene in Latin in Latin America specifically. Um, Brazil is I think third in the world uh, in esports enthusiasts, uh, which is at just over ten million uh, behind China and the US. Considering how big competitive sports, uh, Etienne, you said it's football and religion. Uh, how competitive sports like football are uh, are in Latin America, it would make sense that esports are also popular. Um, do you see an increase in esports um, also affected by an increase in mobile gaming? Uh, whoa, Etienne first, and then maybe Tom, if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I mean, Bra- Brazil is by far the, the most developed country in Latin America towards esports. I mean, whatever scene you're looking at, there's always going to be a Brazilian representative. For example, you take out a strike. I believe Brazil has one of the best teams out there. You take League of Legends. They're also like really good. But again, I, I see uh, there's also a tendency towards like different regions and how they perform and, how, and the base of the players. Because, for example, if you if you take Latin America, then shooters and FPS have a, a, a tendency to grow here. But then, if you take like strategy games like League of Legends or even like auto chess, even though the the new auto chess that everyone has been going on or or cards game, I mean the base is it's growing, but it's still not like the in, in terms of averages, it's not as big as other regions. But definitely Brazil, it's it's amazing. Like when I moved here, it was amazing to see that this is normal. Like I go to a bar and you you get to see like you know esports in the TV. So I'm like I'm in my I'm in my jam here. But <laughs> I, I also believe that like 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 it was mentioned like mobile open up the door to this. Like mobile gaming for me personally and like professionally, it opened up the gate to people to start looking more and not feeling. I don't want to say ashamed, because I was when I was young, but that changed completely. Like, you would be the, the weirdo if you were playing games, you know? I would go to my house, start playing games, and I wouldn't stop. Like, weekend was on, and I wasn't going out. I was I was still playing games. Like, I wanted to invite people over. We were not going to see football. We were going to play games. But mobile helped that, helped really develop that. And people, like, because right now, everybody has a phone. And of course, if you're going to go into Latin America, then there are two two things you got to be sure. First, you got to be sure your Android version is good. And second, you got to be sure your 
your, your the version that you're gonna develop for Android it's also gonna be able to to be used by like you know just not so high end phones. You gotta make sure it's it's able for everyone. No, it ma doesn't matter the kind of phone. So you gotta have a, a version that that's either light or or just it's gonna be able to work on any phone, not just you know the high ends. But that really helped the case because I see a lot of people not only shift like if they're really into it. For example, you take Fortnite. That was huge because people started playing on on their phone. A lot of people. And then they started saying, hey, I really want to get good at this. What they did, they were playing on their phone. They started building their setup. So now they're playing on the CPU. Why? Because if you're really going to take the game seriously, then you don't want to make it harder than it already is. You're not going to see a, a Fortnite player just playing on their phones. Because unfortunately, it, it's not the right tools for the end game, which is like being the best at a tournament. If you see a Fortnite tournament, then it's all going to be, you know, just the computer but so mobile had a huge impact on this and i think it's only gonna continue to grow i think we're on the right track here and tom anything to add i think uh Chen uh, summed it up pretty well um I I, yeah <laughs> I, i'm sorry i i get carried by this I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> this is like <laughs> yeah it's like your passion uh, your passion <laughs> project like i can tell i can tell but that's great well though. yeah i was i was i was so lucky to to be able to be a part of this and you have if, if we ever encountered each other at a, one event like gdc gamescom whatsoever you'll see me i have i just have a smile face like you, you'll just see my smile all over the place and i'll be <laughs> running around and the few minutes i get to just you know out of meetings, I'll test other games. I'll I'll talk to anyone. It's you'll yeah. you, you'll you'll find me. <laughs> you like it? Um, yeah. So I I'll 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 move on to maybe to my next question, Etienne. It's it's also to you. Um, and it's it's a it's around UA, which we've kind of discussed. Um, but now kind of flipping flipping the the picture, if you will. LATAM is, is pretty underrepresented in UA um, when it comes to kind of foreign budgets. I think there are less than 1% of foreign annual budgets are spent locally, even though LATAM accounts for kind of 4% of global game revenue, um, which, which sort of implies that there's a, a, a sizable opportunity here for global developers. So CPIs are a fraction of the cost, um, and yet you see sort of similar rates of engagement. Do you think that we're going to see as more kind of global developers become aware of the potential of the uh, the Latin market, do you think we're going to see CPIs getting more expensive in the future? Yeah, definitely. I mean, Latin, uh, and I always say this, it's like the, the guest you invite to a party and it's always late, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the world is working towards something and then we're late. Like the, you had countries in quarantine and we were late. Like you, you see it in any industry whatsoever. Latam is that guest that's always late to the country. So I definitely see that we're catching up and I definitely see people starting to realize, hey, Latam is not only a, a region that we can do like, you know, just soft load tests and whatsoever, but it's it's starting to actually make sense. And, and there are massive opportunities here, like you mentioned. And I, I think the what's missing here is the, the right monetization strategy because doing ua i mean yeah you can buy cpis are super low i mean if you compare it to other like markets like uk australia you know the us japan whatever then latam it's a great country to test but if you're able to build and really monetize your product on the region then it's a gold mine because there are a lot of people like mobile penetration here is huge. And again, gamers are growing by the minute. So it's just a matter of choosing the right strategy for the right regions. Like you see games just and like, well, disclaimer layer, I'm going to fire a, a couple shots, but you got to understand what's really going on in Latam. I mean, there is always going to be an economic crisis in the vast majority of the countries here. So you cannot put the same prices that you have that your game has in the US it's not just oh yeah i'm just going to you know take how much is a dollar in a i don't know in a real that that's a, the currency here in brazil and just adapt it to that because you know the the economic situation is not the same so you really got to think and and see like 
which games are blowing in in-app purchases and really compare their prices between their countries because you'll see that's what they're doing. And then ads, again, if you, if you know, like, like Tom mentioned, in-app purchases aren't really like that big. They, they don't feel secure. They're not really, they're st they, they still haven't gotten to the party. They don't really trust, you know, paying something with their phones. Then try to build ads and new placements, really find the strategy. But if you do that, then you'll see the, the real potential of Latin. That's uh, what's interesting. What's uh, what stands out to me throughout this conversation is that we always talk about Latam uh, as one big market or even one big country. Um, and and of course, I see why that is. You know, there's a except for Brazil, there's a shared language, um, perhaps also a shared culture in some ways. Um, do you think that for for uh, global developers, global publishers, it is better to view Latin America as one big market, or do they need a different approach per country? I, I mean, the, there, there's, there are a lot of behaviors. Like, for example, if you're building a, a game strategy, then definitely look at LATAM as a, a, as a whole market, just as a whole region. But if you're going to look into, like, campaigns, creatives, then no, I would definitely go by country. It doesn't matter how, how small the country is, but you really want to, like look deep into that. And by that, I mean, for example, if I'm doing a, a campaign for Peru or Argentina, yeah, they're both Spanish, but then it's a completely different dialogue. And I cannot express this enough. It's like the changes we've seen when we're localizing our ads, when we're localizing our games, it's amazing. It, it's simply amazing. Like I've, I've seen 30 to 35 CPI reductions just by using, you know, the right words the, or just by communicating like locals do. So I wouldn't suggest if you're like when it comes to localization, it's super important to 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 look at, at it by by country and not as a region. But in terms of the ad strategy and the monetization strategy, then yes, look at it as a, as a region because the ECPMs are, are are very similar. Like, yeah, Brazil and Mexico have the have the higher ECPMs on the region, but it's only by a small fraction, and that is only because they have you know more more brands that are investing in those countries, and those countries are better economically than the others. But I mean, the the behavior of the users. It's pretty similar, but localization, it's always going to be like one of the, like the cornerstone of a, of a successful marketing campaign and a successful game on those countries. Mm -hmm. And as a last question, um, Etienne, what tips do you have for uh, LATEM developers who are kind of looking to uh, make it either kind of uh, locally or, or I guess it's probably more interesting also to look at how, how can they break into the global market? Well, I mean, it, it, I believe it, it, it shifts a lot, depends on the, the, the volume of your studio. If you're a smaller studio, like I mentioned, I mean, the industry is shifting in a way that right now I would, I would definitely like always talk to other peers for, for starters. To, to see what they did in the past, how they, they can help you. If there's something about this industry that I felt that was always good, it's everyone is, well, the vast majority is welcoming. Of course, don't talk to vendors. They're always going to be like welcoming, but talk to <laughs> other peers that just maybe had had the chance and they, had, they were lucky enough to have experience with our games and they'll be able to share those thoughts. But I mean, just think, and analyze the market. I, I don't see people are analyzing the market enough. It's just like the same way the other regions look at LATAM. It's like, oh, we're going to test it. LATAM does the same thing with other countries. It's like, oh, yeah, that country is CPI. It's a tier two. The CPI, it's, I don't know, like $2. And we have the creatives in their language. So let's go with it. You don't want that to happen. Like you don't want to, you know, save energy <laughs> to say something when you're, actually going to do something like running a campaign or putting your game out there. You really want to analyze the market and see like, okay, wh wh what are the type of games that are there? Wh what are the top charts? What are the like t top sessions spend? Like, well, also, how is the user behavior? Is it in a purchase is it ad base? Is it hyper casual? Is it mid core? Is it Western? It it it's not like you really want to take as much, 
like it's a multiple factor equation and you really want to put everything there to have your chances of success at least like one point higher that, that's all again the industry is super hard but you really want to analyze the market you want to analyze your game you want to test other games like for the love of god i, I know it's it can be a little like hard if you're doing a color like a coloring app and you gotta test it but trust me on this just play every game that's similar to yours and analyze analyze them what are their top like 10 markets why and just you, you'll see there's so much information out there it's just you gotta be creative when analyzing it and when just adding that information to your own experiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well uh, I think that probably makes a lot of sense to people. Uh, and thank you, Etienne uh, and Tom, for being on the show today. It's been super interesting. Etienne, we love your passion. Um, <laughs> uh, everyone else, thank you for listening, as always. Uh, and tune in next episode for more interesting insights on another emerging gaming market. Mm -hmm.